Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast for parents, coaches, and athletes. The Sportlight refers to the time in an athlete's life when they have increased ability to affect the culture around them and the increased opportunity to learn life's lessons through sports. This podcast aims to help parents and coaches capitalize on their athletes' precious time in the Sportlight. The Sportlight Podcast is brought to you by Especially for Athletes program. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast. This week, we want to take a little trip down memory lane. Yesterday, something amazing happened to an amazing person. One of our former guests, former University of Utah star, Eric Weddle, he got called out of retirement to play for the Rams who had an injured secondary and help lead the Rams to a Super Bowl championship. And it's always incredible when great things happen to great people. So what we thought we would do today is let you hear a few of his post-game comments and then also tie in some of the philosophies that give you a peek into the life of someone who could come out of retirement and play in the playoffs and help lead his team to a Super Bowl because Eric Weddle is an incredible person. So first, I love this portion of his post-game conference. It's uh, never in a million years that I think I would be able to have this moment as a player because my career was done. And for everything to ha have to happen, uh, not just this season with, with uh, Fuller and Rap going down, but over the last 15 years, certain things had to happen for me to be in this moment. And to uh, finish it off the way we did is really just something you hear out of a book, right? Or a story, um, uh, you know, a fiction fairy tale that only you only wish that, that your name would be a part of it. And lucky me, it's about me. And uh, I'm a world champ now. You know, the games that we've been a part of have been pretty wild and crazy, but we've never wavered and we never stopped believing. And it started with our head coach and the leaders on this team of just one play at a time mindset and staying in the moment, uh, and especially for us older guys. Like, we know how hard it is to get here, right? Some of us, this is my first time, right? And I, it took me 15 years to get here. So we just don't want to miss this opportunity and not do whatever you can to, to make the most of it. And we sure did. Yes, I'm re-retiring. Uh, it was pretty much set in stone. Uh, so yeah, I'll go back to my, my daily life. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty banged up right now. But hey, it's well worth it. Well worth the moment. And uh, man, if I, didn't, if I didn't say, you know, I, I gotta thank a lot of people real quick. I'll try to be quick, you know. I, I would definitely want to thank, uh, you know, Raheem and Coach E for this wild and crazy idea, right, to bring me back. Thank, uh, I want to thank the Chargers for drafting me, right? And I also want to thank uh, old Tom Telesco for the way it, things ended there and showing me the light and giving me that motivation and that fire, uh, the way things ended there. I appreciated that, and I always said, that Eric Weddle will get the last laugh. And I'm a world champion now. You're great! I am. I, I, <laughs> you're dang right. You ever say, you ever said I'm good, man. Great, but back to it. Uh, funny thing how things come right back around. And I've always tried to treat people with respect and love and kindness. And you should be able to get that in return. And when that doesn't, uh, Good things happen to good people. So thank you for that. Thank you for the Ravens for giving me that, that second chance. And obviously the Rams all the way down the organization for believing in me and, and taking this old man out of retirement. My teammates, uh, training staff, Tyler and Reggie, everyone had a hand in this moment. So in this next brief clip, he talks about Aaron Donald and his other teammates. And it was just cool to hear the way he talked about his teammates and the things he admired about them. And then to reflect back on what kind of a person he wanted to be when he talked to us in our podcast a few months ago. So here's his comments on Aaron Donald and his other teammates. I mean, he's one of one. Uh, you know, I play with a lot of great players. I, you know, he is the, the best uh, 
he just he just brings the room up, man. He makes you want to be better by his work ethic, by his aura about himself, his mindset. And, uh, you know, not just for him. I mean, for Odell, for Matt, for Big Wit. I mean, a lot of us older guys, for myself, like, you know, we all we all wanted to do it for each other. And when you're really battling and fighting for each other for a bigger, bigger goal than yourself, man, greatness happens. And, uh, gosh, he, he was unstoppable. Our front really carried us in the second half and really deserve all the praise uh, for getting this win because, you know, they really uh, took it to the next level when we needed them to. Won the Super Bowl, baby. Does this make you want to come back? No. <laughs> Not at all, baby. I'm, I'm riding off in the sunset. So it was really cool to hear Eric talk about that good things happen to good people and to know some of his philosophies and some of the things that he feels about the way you should treat other people. It was just awesome to hear him mention that in the press conference and then to remember what he told us about what kind of a teammate he believed he should be and even how he believed that he should treat other people in the league. And so we want you to hear that portion of the podcast that he recorded with us just a, a few months ago. There's this cool moment. I mean, it was a great interview, but um, but he just asked you what you were most proud of, you know, reflecting on almost 30 years of football at that point. Mm. And you made, you made a few comments and I was just wondering if you'd share, cause I think these will resonate really well with what we're actually trying to do with sports and our, and our children. I was accountable. I was durable and I gave my all and the teammate and the man that I was, those, those were the two the two things that as you reflected, you know, you said, I don't care about all the tackles. I don't, you know, you could say whatever yeah, you yeah. want about that, mm -hmm. but I was accountable, durable, and I was a great, a great teammate. And, and you even said the kind of man that would leave and, and go pick up a teammate at 1am if they needed, if they needed me at that moment. And that's what you were most proud of. As you reflect on that, just what other thoughts do you have about that? Well, I mean, I always, the, the game of football has brought so, so many blessings, right? So many moments and relationships that I have to this day because of football. And when I say that I was most proud is to be accountable, I, I, throughout my NFL career in college, I never once was late for a meeting, right? And, and I never once missed a practice out of reasons other than, a, you know, if I had my baby being born, right. But even then I didn't miss practice. Right. I, I was there for my baby's born that afternoon. I came back for meetings and was at practice the next day. So I, I just felt that I owed it to my teammates more so than anybody else to be accountable to them and make sure that I was able to be counted on and accountable accountability to yourself and to the ones that you're with is one of the greatest attributes I feel in a man or a woman. Are you accountable? Can I count on you? Are you going to line up? Are you going to be here when I need you? Uh, is Are you someone that if I'm in trouble, that that you're going to be there for me? And, and I always tried to not just strive for that, but to let my teammates know that you can count on me, that I am here for you. I won't judge you. I could care less of the decisions that you may or may not make, but I will support you and I will love you. And that is a trust that is hard to find in the league. And for a lot of guys that grow up in situations, maybe not of the norm to have a teammate be there for them is very uh, not usual. So I always felt that uh, to be accountable, right. To be durable, meaning, are you there? Are you able to work? Are you able to excel? You know, the, the, there was always a slogan, you can't make the club in the tub. And it's so true. You can't make a team if you're injured. And you're, you, there are a number of reasons why that happens. You could be unlucky. Uh, you could be, you don't take care of yourself, right? You don't get your sleep. You don't, uh, you know, take care of your body with what you put in. All those things that make someone have a long career. So, so being durable uh, was something I was proud of. And the relationships 
of the NFL, of college, I've really gravitated towards the relationship aspect of the game of football and the relationships that I have bonded with and are mean so much to me is because I, I took, I took an onus of, of creating those relationships and making those relationships meaningful. Uh, and is it, it was it anything that I could get out of it? I think the bottom line is just, I, I was just trying to be a good teammate, be a good friend, be a good person to these guys. And then these, by doing so, it opens up this whole world that you would never would have got if, if you never opened yourself up to being a good teammate and, and trying to build a relationship with those guys that you're going to be on the field with. And now I'm, I've, I'm best friends, family with a number of guys that I was teammates with only because I wanted to know who they were and what their background was and what made them tick and how could I connect with them and make them a better football player and better teammate, better person. Uh, so when I think back of my career, uh, I think back at the relationships. I think about how hard I worked and how I got every ounce of ability out of this body, mind, soul uh, every day. I never took a day off. I never took a day for granted. And, you know, when I talk about how I was as a football player, I still have those principles. Now I want to be the best 12 U head coach in the entire country. Right. Because if you're not going to do something, if you're not going to try to be the best at it, what is the point? You know, I, I, I despise the word average or good for that matter. Are you, I'm not okay with being good. You shouldn't be okay with being good. Good is average. You know, there's millions and millions of people that are good at what they do, but who are the great ones? That's what I wanted to be. That's what I strive to be in every facet of my life, whether it's being a husband, whether it's being a father, whether it's training my dog, whether it's being a coach to these boys. And I'm not perfect by any means. I make mistakes every day, like everybody else. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm not trying to be great at everything I do. So uh, by having that mindset, it was it resonated and, and went through every facet of my life. I wanted to be a great teammate. I wanted to be the greatest safety ever that season, right? And what it took to do that. I wanted to be a great husband, a great teammate, a great friend. Uh, and all those things uh, made it that, that I would – I think all those things correlated to having a long career because of where I put my priorities were in line was being a good teammate, being accountable, being durable, sacrificing everything that I could be there for my teammates and the relationships that you get from that will, will last a lifetime. Not so much how many picks, interceptions, touchdowns, tackles, like nobody's going to remember that. Right. They remember if you're a good teammate, what could you be counted on? Right. You know, those are the things that matter, man. I, <clears throat> any parents that are listening to this, I, the last, you know, four minutes or so there that, that uh, Eric just spoke, I would highly coming from a, as a coach, someone who's been doing this a long time, I would highly encourage you to sit down with your son or daughter and just replay the last five minutes of what, of what Eric just said. And to ask your son or daughter specifically, Eric, you said something there when you were talking about, I wanted to be the best safety right after that, you said, and then to do what it took or do what it takes to be that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think as parents, what you just said, like I said, that was gold, by the way, Eric, I was getting fired up listening to you. <laughs> yeah. and I, I had a hundred boys at 6am this morning and had a, oh, similar, there you go. had a similar conversation with them about yeah. not settling and, and, how I just can't be around apathetic um, people that, that don't want to be their best. It, it's, it's hard for me to be around that. And, 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 uh, but you, but that point you made about what does it take? It's one thing to say, yeah, I want to be a good teammate or yeah, I, absolutely. I'm a good teammate. I, what does it take to be a good teammate? And, and you mentioned that in there that to be a good teammate, it's getting to know your teammates. It's taking time to chat with them about, you know, their life and being willing to go and, and pick a guy up if you had to at one o'clock or to 
check in on a guy that you feel like might be struggling, something's going on. I think we forget, and, and I actually wouldn't mind you touching on this for a second. We forget that, that these athletes are also regular people and that they have their own issues outside of what you see on a Sunday out on a football field or for a high school kid on a Friday night that the kid's got a girlfriend. He might have a class he's struggling with. He may have a problem with the parent that he goes home to every day or just issues at his house and a good teammate. And you can elaborate on this. We, we say, keep your eyes up, eyes up, mm-hmm. do the work, right? We wear mm-hmm. a wristband that says, keep your eyes up. Part of being a good teammate is at practice having your eyes up. And when you see a teammate that something seems off doing the work to go find out what's going on. Right. And I'm guessing that in your career in, in high school and college and in the NFL, you probably to be the kind of teammate that I know you were, you had your eyes up, but you did the work, you saw things and then you were, weren't afraid to go and engage in that teammate's life and take on some of their pain to help them. Right. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and that's, that is a learned uh, aspect in someone's life, right? Was I the same? Uh, obviously not in high school, college, or, or even NFL as I am now. No, but those experiences helped me grow into that more outgoing, uh, being more intentful with your teammates and, and acknowledging uh, situations that are out there and being able to listen. Right. I think I think more people now, if they just took a step back and listen to people and hear them and not and just listen. Right. So a lot of times all you need to do is listen. And that's all people need at that moment in time is to listen. And it, over time, I think, you know, high school. I love my teammates, college. Well, my freshman year, I was on a one track mission to start and to earn my respect. And I didn't really care about what my teammates thought of me. Right. Because I was programmed my senior year by a guy that played in the NFL, played college ball. That was his mindset. He instilled in me for my freshman year. And that's that was that was all I was thinking about. And after that year. And going through the ups and downs of the older guys and learning and failing and falling down and trying to find the the inner line of things as a young freshman made me realize that that's not what the game is about. And and that's not what this game can bring you if you isolate yourself. And so I kind of changed my mindset and focus of really – enabling myself to open up more to my teammates and having them open up to myself and a funny story, not a funny story, but a a very cool story that I experienced in the NFL that I'll share is, you know, a lot of guys come from all shapes and backgrounds of this country. Right. And where I grew up in California, isn't the same uh, in East Texas or, in southern Mississippi, right, or in New York, or in Iowa, right? There's there's so many different places in this country that have different cultural cultural areas and the way they grew up. And one of my teammates, this is going through all the stuff that's been going on. And do I think this this country is racist? Not one bit. Okay. Do I think there are bad people out there? Of course. There are bad people in every occupation, walks of life, every race, color, religion. Uh, Now, do you group them all up in the same category? No, right? I don't think that at all. But one of my teammates would explain to me how it was playing high school football in Texas in an area that was predominantly white. And he would explain to me that Uh, when he would get ready, their team would get ready to play a rival team in their town. They weren't even allowed to take their bus into that town, which is crazy to think about. They would drive through that town and get rocks thrown at them, cans, sodas. They wouldn't be able to get off the bus. Right. And 
to hear that and to listen to that and to have that resonate for myself, which I grew up in Southern California. I had every race, uh, background, cultural lived on my block when I grew up. Right. I had a black family that lived three doors down. I had a Mexican family lived across the street. And basically we were all just brothers and sisters in our, in our town. Right. So to see that and to hear that from a teammate resonated to me because he experienced that and he's my brother right now. Right. And for me, it's those little experiences uh, and stories and feelings of teammates opening up to me because I was willing to listen. And I had a genuine emotion and, and heartfelt that I wanted to get to know them on a personal level, not just as a linebacker safety combo, making calls together, right? It was important for me to know them on a personal level, know how they grew up, know who they were, how their parents were. Did they have brothers and sisters? What other sports did they do? do the, what's, what, uh, did they like, what was their favorite subject, right? What is, what's their favorite food to eat? All those things matter. Uh, not just because it'll make us closer on the football field, but at the end of the day, this teammate, Zach Orr, who's coaching in Jacksonville with Coach Meyer, which is kind of funny how all that went out. But Zach Orr, literally, I, we were texting yesterday, and we, we hadn't played since 2016, right? And that would have never happened if, if I didn't sit there and try to get to know him and, and try to be there for him. And, and I think, and, and that's when I say what I'm most proud of, I am more proud of the relationship I built with Zach and still communicate with him and still there for him than how I played with him that one season together. So Eric, I have a question and this is every now and then I've learned with young people, it's good to help them see what it looks like. If, I mean, you have your son coming up now, you know, 12 U football and he's going to be up in high school and looking back at Eric Weddle when you were a high school player, what, what would you say to a high school kid who says, what does that look like in high school? Like, what would you do if you were a team captain of a high school football team right now? What are some of the things you, you would do now with those players on your team? What would that look like with them? Well, I mean, the leaders of, of any team set the standard of, of how they act, right, and how they represent themselves, but the team. And the team always comes before the individual. And, and that's – I've been taught that from, from the day I can remember playing football or any sport for that matter. And, and it would be the guy that was very confident in himself that he's willing to help the guy next to him. Right. I never understood uh, how guys in the NFL were weren't willing to help younger guys on their team. Right. Like it really would come down that they are that insecure with themselves that they wouldn't be willing to teach or help the young guy underneath them. And I never quite understood that because at the end of the day, if if I'm not good enough and a younger guy is better than me, then so be it. Right. That's competition. That, that's, that's a great, that's the game of life, right? If, if someone is better than you and they deserve your spot, then so be it. They earned it. But it, it shouldn't come to the, to the loss of you not helping them because you're insecure or you're worried about your job. Like, I don't know. I, 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 always, I never quite understood that. And that, when I, when I experienced that as a young guy in the league, guys basically disregarded me trying to finagle it so I wouldn't do well and then reaching out to some older guys and then not even taking one second to return my call or text to, to just to pick their brain that I immediately changed that focus of reaching out to young safeties in the league, whether they're on my team or on other teams and to let them know that I'm here for them, that if you need help on and off the field, I'm here. It's not easy you feel alone. You have every temptation you can think of 
in the league. And it's, it's hard. It's hard, let alone to, to try to find and earn a spot, but now to navigate through life as an adult, as a 20 year old. And I did that. And it was amazing to see the impact you could have on just reaching out to guys and saying you're there for them and that you don't, I don't need anything in return. Right. I just want you to know that I'm here, whether you need help on and off the field, you need help breaking down film, you need help moving or, or hiring an agent or this and that. It doesn't matter because I didn't get that. And I, and I knew how important it is to have someone to lean on, right? And, that, and it's no different for high school kids or your older kid on a 12U team. They set the standard. And the standard is the standard. What do you expect out of that, of your team, right? Of your top guy, he is the reflection of the head coach and what he believes and what he, what he has put forth as what he expects out of his team, how they act, how they play. What is our mindset? Are we physically tough? Are we mentally tough? Do we not beat ourselves? All those little cliche type things matter. But if your leaders don't follow suit, your team is – will erode from the inside. You uh, <clears throat> you played in the NFL, I'm, I'm guessing, at around 195 pounds? Yeah, I started at 205, and by my last year, I was 195. So, so I dropped it down the more years I played. <laughs> and you're about, what, 5'10", 5'11"? Yeah, 5'11", and so the, the, three eights. Yeah, the, the point I'm getting at is that um, most I'm guessing, and I didn't know you in high school, but I'm guessing that when you were in high school, you know, we probably were playing it less than that. And yeah, and probably not, uh, having a lot of people think you'd have 1200 tackles in the NFL at the time, you know, when you're a five, 10, 180 pound or 75 pound senior, whatever you were. And, you know, I, 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 when we were hanging out down in San Diego, we talked a little bit about your recruiting process and it, it wasn't like you were flying all over the country, going to all the, the big schools everywhere. You ended up at Utah and, and now you look back at your career. Talk to that kid listening to this or to that parent listen to this who's, you know, 5'11", 180 pounds, pretty good athlete. You were exceptional with your speed and other things, but that – my guess is you had to absolutely 100% outwork the heck out of everybody to get to where you were and that there were no breaks and sleeping in and diet and everything. So touch a little, one of our principles and especially for athletes is, is resiliency. And we obviously use that phrase, do the work. And both mm -hmm. of those are, you know, synonymous, I think with Eric Weddle and how you got to where you are being resilient and doing the work. Talk to that kid about the kind of effort that it took, the real effort that it took. Well, it's, uh, you know, I think I look at my, uh, you know, life and sports and, and I played football, basketball, and baseball all the way up until my senior year. And, you know, back when we played, Working out, running and lifting wasn't a huge priority in a sense. It, it hadn't come into focus at, at the high school level, I felt. Uh, yeah, I don't even think I started lifting weights until my sophomore, junior year of high school. And then even at that point, it was, it was kind of like a half an hour, once a week type deal. Uh, and as I got older, obviously, you know, what we know now, we would definitely change what we what we would have done back in high school level. That's, that's the reality. You live and learn, you grow and realize a lot of things are much more important than some things. Uh, so for me uh, at the high school level, I just loved, I, I kid you not, even to this day, even my last year in LA, I loved the competition of, of anything that we were doing. And I loved proving myself no matter who I was going against, uh, that I was better. And, and it really, it really motivated me every step of the way. And as I got older and everything that takes into account of doing the work, right. And, and sacrificing 
everything, right? The, the fine line of, of great and good is, it, it is a lot, but it isn't. It, it's, that, it's that guy that's willing to sacrifice uh, an hour's sleep of waking up earlier to get his work in than the other guy that sleeps in and, and goes off to school. It's the guy that instead of playing video games till midnight, he's going to bed at 10 o'clock. It's the guy that's not going to be eating junk food in the middle of the night and is, is going to eat a healthy snack. It's the guy that is willing to do whatever it takes to reach his goal. Now, what is your goal? If a guy came to me, a high school kid came to me and said, hey, coach, I want to play college football. I said, okay, I think, I think most kids – nowadays can play college football you really want to play college football okay well will you get a scholarship that's not guaranteed but you can walk on in any school you want to and from there it's on you now you're now you're getting the perks of college right you can work out you can get nutrition all the stuff that is needed to excel right and i had a i had a conversation with with a kid over at the local high school and he's they were on the, I think the eighth ranked volleyball team in the nation and it went to Poway high and he's getting ready to go up to BYU. I think he's going to serve a mission first. I'm not, I'm not really hundred percent sure, but he didn't know if he was going to play uh, or try to play. And I said, I said, bud, you do know that once it's done, it's done. Right. It, you, you can't you can't go back in time to go back and play because you had a you rekindled that at college athletics. And I said, what do you have to lose? Right. To walk on at BYU and see what happens. You don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. You start working out. You start training. You start dieting at a whole nother level that you never even thought possible. But you're going to hold yourself down just because in your mind, you may not think you're, it's possible, right? So I, as I say that, I say that to football players. If you really want to play, you can play. The only thing that's holding you back is, is doing the work. And that's really what separates the good and the great ones. The ones that are willing to do it and the other ones that do the minimum. And it's no different at the highest levels, right? The reason I played for as long as I did and had as much success I did as an individual, one, there are a number of reasons. One is I outworked everybody. It, not only on my team, but when I stepped on that field, everyone across from me, I knew I outworked them. I knew that nobody in the league was getting up at 5 a.m., working out, rehabbing, eating, meetings, working out again after practice, meetings, then at the end of the night, rehabbing and working out again, and then watching film by myself till eight o'clock at night, 8.30, and getting home and my kids are asleep. I hadn't even seen them all day. There was nobody, nobody doing that. So on, I, I had to leg up on that, on the competition immediately just because I outworked them, right? So, so to say that, oh, I was just talent. My talent was better than well, well I, yeah, I am talented, but I outworked every single person in there. I put in more into my profession than anybody else because I wanted to be great. I wanted to make the most of this opportunity because at the end of the day, I'm living my dream out, right? To sit, to sit here and say that Eric Weddle, I, if I told you you were going to play 13 years, in the NFL, you had great success. You would end up having a healthy, long career. When I was in high school, I would have said, there's zero chance of that. There's no chance. I don't believe you. I would pay millions of dollars before I believe that, right? And then when that actually happens, I told myself every day that there's not a day that goes by that I shouldn't have a smile on my face and outwork and do everything possible to make this dream the most it could be because I am living my dream out, right? How many people can say they're living their dream out? Not many, 
So if you have that chance or you have that opportunity, high school football is a dream of yours. Well, let's make the most of it. If you want to play college football, it's a dream of yours. Go make it happen. Right. And you'll have help along the way, but it's going to be on you. Right. You're going to determine and make that decision. If you want to do the work, if you want to sacrifice everything to make that goal happen. And that's one of the main reasons, obviously, my wife, my faith, my priorities, staying true to to what my mindset was helped along the way, staying healthy. But I think staying healthy was because I worked so hard. And I did the work. So is that hand in hand or the guys that are always injured? Is it because they don't take care of their bodies? I don't know. I don't know. It's only for them for the decide. But I just go off of my experience. And uh, at the end of the day, if you put the work in, you'll reap the benefits. Eric, thank you. That's, uh, that is awesome. I, I can't <laughs> wait for my own kids to listen to this podcast. <laughs> Um, can I ask you a question? You, you were showing us a little bit, those jerseys behind you and, and something you already said about calling the safeties from other teams, the young safety. Mm -hmm. We have a really important core principle and especially for athletes that we try to teach people to compete like crazy, but to do so without contempt, to compete without hate. And it sounds like somewhere along the way, you learned that lesson to a, to a really high level about how to be super competitive, but not hating your opponent or even those who you're trying to beat out for a position. What have you learned along the way that's allowed you to, to do that? Man, it's a great, it's a great question. Great point. And it's, it's uh, something I'd love to expound on because it really, I think that's what separated myself than maybe everyone that, that, has played at, at a high level or played my position. And as you can see, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, give these guys, I mean, you know, all those guys, Cam, Brian Clark, uh, Quentin Jammer, Aaron Williams, Michael Griffin, uh, the numbers are back, Anthony Levine, uh, Reggie Nelson, uh, Manti Teo, uh, all those guys, ha ha Clinton Dix. I, I can keep going on and on those, those guys. I am, I am super close with because I wanted them to reach heights that I had experienced. I wanted them to see the joy and the excitement of going to a pro bowl or being announced as an all pro, right? I wanted them. I wanted to, I wanted them to experience that. And the only way you can do that is one to have the confidence in yourself. You're very secure with yourself and to have a balance of when we're on the field, when we're on the field, I'm trying to rip your face off. You know, take that in context. <laughs> Me meaning, meaning, okay, I don't see, I don't see names. I don't see numbers. I see a body that's doing a drill next to me. And I'm trying to prove to everybody and myself that I'm better than you. Okay. But as soon as we get off that white line or we get off the drill, my mind switches over and now I'm helping you. And it, it was very easy for me, right? If I'm on the field and I, and, and a play is going on, I am competing no matter who you are, but there is no emotional attachment to what I'm doing on the field. It's about getting the job done. It's about me being the very best I could be and pushing myself to the ultimate limit, right? But as soon as I cross that line of now I'm not in the team drill, I'm not in seven on seven, I'm next to my teammate. Hey, how can I help you? What were you seeing out here? Yeah, I, I got beat on this. Well, well, where were your eyes, right? And it was the same thing in the in when I'm going in the games, right? I never disrespected my opponent. I never tried any ill will against them, right? Because I I respect this game. I'm thankful for this game and how much it's brought to my life and how much it's it's helped me to grow and learn. And so that would be the last thing I would ever try to do is is try to bring someone down at the expense of for myself. And 
I don't know when that clicked. Uh, I don't know when I felt that that's the approach. I, I have always tried to be the very best on the field, but never once did I shy away from helping someone. And I, I, and I think that's as long as I can remember. And that brings the very best out of you. And it brings the very best out of your teammates. It doesn't matter how great I am in a team sport. If I can't get my 10 teammates to raise their level of play, then it means nothing. We won't be very good. And for the backups, right? If to raise their level of play to either one day take my job because I'm not good enough anymore, or they go on to another team and earn a starting job, right? It's, it, it all matters. It, it all matters how you treat people, how you work, how you uh, communicate, how you listen. All that stuff matters, not just being a great player, but being a great teammate and helping others along the way. And it, it was, it was, you know, every day I, I tried to be my very best and to, uh, you know, my last year in LA, right. I'm the new guy, you know, obviously people know who I am and know my, my, the career I had, but they don't, they don't know what type of player I am. So every day I had to show and prove that I can earn a spot on this team. Right. And along the way, I'm helping others. So when Eric Weddle retires, who's the guy that, that takes over? John Johnson. And what did he do? He wore the headset just like I did the year before. And he sat right next to me for the entire season. And what did I do between any time the coach was talking? What was I doing with John Johnson? Explaining and coaching and helping him because I knew that he's going to take over that role. And where, where that ended up, he signs a four-year deal, three-year deal in Cleveland for a lot, a lot of money that he did and earned. But that would have never happened. It may have happened. He's a really good player. But I would think that helping him and pushing him and competing in him, me and him would go in drills every day, and I'm trying to destroy him in DB drills as a 35-year-old, and he's a 22-year-old kid, Right? Because I know I'm pushing him to be his very best. But there was never, like I said earlier, it was never ill will. It was never emotionally attached. And the best should always rise up, right? It should never be who your name is, who your parents are, this and that. And that was how I took it, right? If I'm trying my hardest and I'm just not good enough, then so be it. I can live with that. But at the end of the day, my best is usually pretty much better than everybody else. Until, until it isn't, and you have to be, have to understand that, and have that uh, understanding that it's okay to do to be both sides. I mean, I think that's the way it should be. Well, that that mindset, you know, Shad just mentioned one of our principles of competing without contempt. Mm -hmm. We have our, another one. We we tell kids to win the hour. And to re really talking about being in the moment, being present, you know, when, if you're at practice, that's the most important thing in your life at that moment. But when you're, you know, when you're home with your mom in the kitchen and she wants to talk to you about your day that you should talk to your mom, that's the most important thing at the moment, that hour. But that mentality that you just shared, and it was funny because I told you earlier, I wanted to ask you a question about Kobe Bryant, because I knew you looked up to him, but you actually said something that. I thought, man, even sounds like Kobe Bryant talking right now. <laughs> you, you said, you know, you were going up against a 22 year old kid as a 35 year old NFL vet. But right before that, you said, you know, they might've known who I was. I mean, I, you know, and I laughed because like, dude, they for sure knew who you <laughs> were. Like you're Eric, but in your mind, in your mind, here's my Kobe Bryant reference. In your mind, you were like, I got to make sure these guys know who I am. Like, I got to make sure these guys know that I can play, that I'm a good player when like you were the best dude out there, but your mentality was somebody today may be seeing me for the first time, or this may be the last time they see me, or this may be their only time I go on a drill with them. And I got to make sure they know that I'm the dude, right. That I was the guy that I was better than them. And, you know, Kobe Bryant had that mentality after he'd made one MVPs and won everything you can win. He was still out there getting a thousand shots up a day. And because mm. in his mind, he missed a jump shot the night before and it was ticked. He was ticked. Right. Um, 
tell us a little bit about how you took on that mentality of, of that, that whole Kobe Bryant Mamba get it done at whatever cost mentality. Cause it, I, I read an article where you said you really looked up to him. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, you know, I read, I've read every, I, you know, I, I was a, I went to my first Laker game when I was five years old at the great Western forum. My dad and I sat in the nose. We, we could only go to like one game a year. Like, you know, my parents, my mom was a school teacher. My dad worked construction. So we weren't, uh, lived in a little three bedroom, 1500 square foot home. So, uh, it wasn't like we had a bunch of money running around that we could go experience those things. So when I say I, I was to experience that and every night when, when the Lakers would play, I would sit with my dad and watch Laker games with them. And, and that was one of my fondest memories growing up is watching the Lakers on KCAL nine with my dad and, and, in 96 it is when I turned nine and we just drafted Kobe and all those years, right. As I was growing up, it seemed like Kobe and I were just kind of in the same line. He was a couple years ahead of me in the, in the NBA, but as we, as he hit his pinnacle and then reading his, his, uh, you know, his mantra, his story, the books, his trainer, uh, you know, there were so many characteristics of him that I saw in myself. And when, you know, he would talk about the, the work, right. The, the hours and hours, right. And he would come off a year and what would he do? He'd go back and learn something new. He would go and seek out others, right. He would go and, and reach out to Akeem Olajuwon and learn a post move because who better, uh, then a H- Hakeem with post moves and athleticism and, and just silkiness than Hakeem was, you know, but to be able to humble themselves enough to reach out and ask others for help is just, it, it resonated to me. And it, and it just showed that the best of the best were still trying to get better, even when they were the top of their game. And it was, it, it was so true. And it's how I looked at myself that it goes through stages as, as you reach any kind of business, any type of, of level, you're trying to level up and get to the top, right? As you, as you start in business or in sports, your, your, your goal is to earn a role, earn your spot, earn the respect of your teammates, right? Then after a year or two, you, you solidified yourself as a starter. Well, now you're trying to be the upper echelon right? Upper echelon of the league, upper echelon of your business, uh, whether you're a manager, whether you're creating, uh, creating items uh, to, to, to pitch, to create, right? Or to get out to the public and so forth. So now you're trying to get to the upper echelon, right? And if you're two of that, then now it's, I want to be the best. All right. What is it going to take to be the best? All right. You map that out and you and I learned this from Kobe, right? He would, the work, the, the detail, the sacrifice, the hours, right? And that's how I, that's what I did. After my third season in the league, I was just hovering around a good player. And I was like, man, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not satisfied with this. I, what, what do I need to do? And that, from that point on, from my fourth year, when I became, uh, you know, when I signed after that year, I was second team all pro. From that point on, I, I, was determined to do everything possible to be the best. And that was waking up early, uh, studying, eating, everything you can. I mean, I could spend a whole hour on all that stuff. But, but, but Eric, when you say when you say early, what time? <laughs> I mean, there were seasons where I was leaving the house at 4 a.m. All right. That's what I wanted to. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. 4 a.m. So so let me just give you a day of what it was like when I was my last probably 10 years in the league. It was 4 a.m. So I had to drive about 30 minutes to get to the facility. 430. I'd get there. I'd change. I'd work out from 430 to 530. Okay. No one else is in there. Sometimes usually the strength coach that I became close with would meet me there. 530 to 6, I would sauna and cold tub. You know. That was just what my little Nick was six to seven. I'd watch film on my own. Okay. Seven to seven fifteen, I would eat breakfast seven fifteen to about 11 was meetings. 
special teams. Oh, offense, defense. 11 to 11.45, we had a walkthrough. 11.45 to 12.15 was lunch. Okay, then we go back for 45 minutes. 12.15 to 12, 4, 12, 1 o'clock is more meetings. Okay, then we had about 30 minutes for practice, 1 to 1.30. Get ready for practice. Get your ankle tape, whatever it takes, right? 1.30 to, I don't know, 4 o'clock is practice, okay? 4 to 5 is you have to eat your dinner, and do whatever. Well, during that time, I'd go back in the weight room and get more work in. Okay. So five o'clock hits, we have team meeting five to about seven 30, or no five to it's a regular practice. So five to uh, six, five, five 45 is your last meeting of the day. You watch practice. Okay. So five 45, everyone's done. They all shower, go home. What I do, I go out and sauna and cold tub again. Then after that, 6.30, I go watch film for another hour and a half by myself. By that time, I get home, 8 o'clock. Hopefully, my kids are up. Most likely, they're not. And then I would do it all over again every day. Work out three times a day. Sauna cold tub three times a day. Extra film, three hours at least by myself. And I did that, one, to get my work in and outwork everyone else. And two, I never liked to bring work home when I got home. When I was home, I was Eric, the dad, Eric, the husband. I didn't want to be thinking about, you know, you're never not thinking about the game. To, for guys to say you're not thinking about the game when it's season is a total lie. Mm -hmm. And if they are doing that, they're probably not very good. So you're never not thinking about the game. But I didn't want to be watching film or studying the playbook or studying the opponent when I was at home. So I mapped out this time. So when I was at home, you're getting the full 100% of, of Eric Weddle. But the, those things fall in line with exactly who Kobe was and, and how he worked and how he was never satisfied and always was pushing the limits. And it, it just, it makes all the sense in the world, right? If the greatest of the greatest are still pushing themselves to be better, how can you look at yourself and not want to be better? Yeah. Right. And, and that's why I looked up to him and, you know, it's unfortunate, but I was able to meet him uh, for at halftime of his last season. And I was really, I was, I was nervous, obviously. Uh, but I was, I, I was just, you, you just hope when you meet your idol that it, it, it meets your expectations. Right. Because you hear horror stories of people meeting their idols and it goes so bad because the guys are jerks and they don't give you a second. It couldn't have been, I couldn't have planned it and, and thought in my mind how it could have been any, any better. And I'll give you a funny story, a crazy cool story about Kobe Bryant. So me and him, when he came out of halftime, he didn't play this game. And when we were driving up to the game, we got to notice that he's not playing. And we're like, gosh, you know, there goes our chance to meet him. You know, we had set it up that he was going to come at halftime. Anyways, we got a text from his PR guy. He's like, yes, he's still, he's still going to meet you. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, awesome. So we get there. He walks out. Boom, we introduce each other. And then him and I kind of move off to the side. I had three of my best friends there with me. They're diehard Kobe fans. And so we move off the side and we're, we just sat in there and talked about everything, about our kids, about life, about sports. He knew my situation with the Chargers and kind of gave me some words of encouragement. And about 10 minutes later, then we came back to my buddies and Kobe, each of my buddies introduced themselves. Like, hey, my buddy, my, you know, my name's Junior. You know, what's up, Kobe, Eric. And then one of my buddies' name is, is Mo. And we're getting ready to leave and he has to go back and see another family. And, he, and you know, I gave him, dap him up and I'm like, Thank you so much for your time. And, and my buddy Murad says, Kobe, such an honor to meet you. And Kobe Bryant, who just met Mo 20 minutes prior and said maybe three words to him, said, no, Mo, the honor is all mine. And it was just like, this guy meets thousands of people every other day. And he remembered his name. And to say that in that moment just shows you what level of mindset he was at to just know. I mean, that meant the world to my buddy Murad because it was just the mere fact that he took an onus 
to remember his name, right? Like who would do that? I'm terrible with names, so I know I couldn't do it. But for him, the one of the you know the one of the greatest to do it, to make to be in that moment to sh- and to make Mo feel like he's the most important guy in the entire world in that moment was just just incredible to me. And it showed the side of him that not a lot of people ever got to see because he just was that closed off to the world. And we were finally getting a glimpse of who he was as a dad and as a coach and how much he loved his girls and loved the game of basketball and how intellectually advanced he was than everybody else. Uh, but it's just a, such a cool story. And, and, you know, I always try to, to be real and honest and, you know, it gets me in trouble at times, but I don't really care. You know, that's, that's who I am. I say it how it is, but when it comes to the kids and uh, being a role model, uh, I always hope that I I'm like Kobe, right. That, that I make someone feel that important and feel like they matter because everyone matters. Honestly, everyone matters. I'm no different than anybody else. Right. I played NFL for a long time, but I'm no better or bigger or, or anything else than, than every other human being on this earth. And, you know, I think, I think we all need to remember that at the end of the day, that we're all people, we're all brothers and sisters. And there's, there's a good person in everybody. That's awesome. That's great. And that, that leads maybe to maybe one last concept. Um, we go around and we meet with anyone who will listen with us, Eric, <laughs> like listen to yeah. any team, any organization. And we get to speak to a lot of youth and, and we have a phrase that we call the sport light. It's what our podcast is named after the sport light podcast, which is that extra attention that comes to an athlete that puts them in a position to do good for other people. And, and you were just touching on this with, with Kobe Bryant. But we have these athletes that we're trying to help them flip that switch maybe earlier in their brains than we were able to in our own that, mm-hmm. that because they're an athlete in the spotlight, they have that sport light, they could use that position in their high school, in their community, with their own team to really lift people. Do you have any, any message for those young people who about that message of trying to use their position as an athlete to help other people and not just attract attention to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when you think about sports and you think about the light, right. The light that, that is put on, on athletes, it's, it's a great light to have if you use it in the right way. And for me, for me, I would say to the youth is, be proud of who you are and what you stand for and the, the, the work and the accountability and everything that goes into it. But also be that, be that person that, that in the midst of craziness that you stand out for doing good, right? Never, never be, never, never stand back or never be hesitant or be ashamed of doing what's right ever. And when I say that, it, 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 it resonates, and I hope people will listen that it's not just uh, on the field, but more so in life. Are you the person that see, seeing something on the side that maybe a kid's getting bullied, are you going to be the guy that steps in and stops it, right? Are you going to be the guy that, you know, someone has his bag fall out and books are everywhere? Are you going to be the person that helps that person? You know, all those things, when I say everything matters, everything matters, right? You could be the greatest football player ever, greatest basketball player, tennis, whatever. But if you treat people like crap, all that stuff doesn't matter. No one's going to care about you because at the end of the day, they know that you treat people like crap. You don't respect people. So when I tell my boys, I tell my son, everything matters. Everything matters on how you treat people, how you talk to your mother, how you act towards others. Are you nice? Are you respectful? Do you help others? Do you serve others? Right. And when you're in the light as an athlete, you're looked at as being able to do those and being able to change people and to help others. 
right? And so what I would tell the youth is, is venture out, be proud of being an athlete, but being, being proud that you're able to be in a situation to help others. Because at the end of the day, if we're not helping others, then we're doing a disservice to everybody. And being an athlete, being in those positions where you're looked at as maybe uh, uh, as leaders of your community, as leaders of the school, as people that, you know, you do it right on the football team, right? You're never late. You never miss a uh, workout. You never miss a, uh, you know, uh, assignment on the field. Well, that should carry over into your normal life, right? People should look at you as, as a great student, as a great friend, as someone that can be counted on. And, you know, I would tell them to stand out and to push yourselves to help others because you can and that, and that it's, it's built in you, right? Not everybody has the personality to venture out and help others. It's just not reality. And, the, and it's not for everyone. But if you are and you can, you should not pass up an opportunity to do what is right. Congratulations, Eric Weddle. Couldn't happen to a better guy what happened to you yesterday. And we're all so happy for you. It's so awesome when great things happen to great people. And Eric Weddle is truly a great person who lives his life by principle. And we hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane and that you will take those philosophies that Eric Weddle shared with us, the way he treats his teammates, the way he tries to be great and not just good in everything that he does. Take those and put them into your life and your sports life and your personal life and your business life, and we'll all be better for it. So keep your eyes up and do the work. This has been the Sport Life Podcast from Especially for Athletes, sponsored by Coca-Cola. You can learn more about Especially for Athletes by visiting the website at especiallyforathletes.org. You can also learn more about the book, The Sport Light, by Shad Martin and Dustin Smith at especiallyforathletes.org slash book.